This is Dr. Mitch Robinson and this video is on the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. It accompanies handout number seven from cellular and molecular medicine. In this video I'll describe how the energy that's available in the form of reduced coenzymes is used to produce ATP in the mitochondria. Before we talk about energy production in mitochondria, we need to describe the basic structure of mitochondrial membranes and its unique DNA. This image shows a mitochondria being guided through a cell by microtubules. You can see two membranes of the mitochondria. The outer membrane has pores created by proteins called porins, and these allow fairly large molecules to pass through. The inner membrane, on the other hand, has very limited permeability. Most molecules that pass through the inner membrane do so using very specialized transporter proteins, and I'll talk about these in a few minutes. So the process by which the energy from the oxidation of fuel molecules is used to supply the energy for ATP synthesis in mitochondria is referred to as oxidative phosphorylation. So we have two ways to make ATP, through substrate level phosphorylation, where ATP is produced by coupling an energetic reaction to the reaction where ATP is produced from ADP and phosphate, and oxidative phosphorylation, which is a fairly complex process that occurs in the mitochondria using molecular oxygen. Now, oxidative phosphorylation involves two processes, and this is shown on the bottom of page two of your handout. First, the electrons in the form of reduced coenzymes, NADH and FADH2, are transferred to a series of electron carriers in the inner mitochondrial membrane. This is known as the electron transport chain. As the electrons are passed from carrier to carrier, the energy is conserved through the transport of protons across the inner mitochondrial membrane, forming a proton gradient. Second, the energy of the proton gradient is used to synthesize ATP from ADP and phosphate by the ATP synthase complex. Now let's take a look at the electron transport chain. The reduced electron carrier molecules have a strong potential to donate electrons, and oxygen has a very high affinity for electrons. So there's a great deal of energy available if we transfer electrons from reduced NADH and FADH2 to oxygen to form water. The electron transport chain utilizes this energy to form a proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane. The electron transport chain is composed of proteins that are clustered into complexes known as complex 1, 2, 3, and 4. These complexes have several different prosthetic groups associated with the proteins. This includes cytochromes that have an iron molecule in the center of the porphyrin ring. Similar to the heme group of hemoglobin, except the iron and the cytochromes can accept an electron. There are also iron sulfur proteins that contain clusters of iron and sulfur atoms in various arrangements. Ubiquinone is a lipid soluble electron carrier. It's also known as coenzyme Q or CoQ10. The 10 refers to the number of isoprenoid units in the molecule. Cholesterol is also synthesized from isoprenoid units and cholesterol synthesis uses some of the same enzymes as coenzyme Q. Drugs that inhibit cholesterol synthesis also inhibit CoQ synthesis. So CoQ10 supplements are often recommended for those taking statins to lower cholesterol. Now let's look at the organization of these complexes in the inner mitochondrial membrane and the path of electrons through the complexes. The table on the bottom of page three identifies the proteins and prosthetic groups associated with each complex. Now you do not need to memorize the names and prosthetic groups, but the names will tell you the reaction each complex carries out. Complex one transfers electrons from NADH to coenzyme Q. Complex two transfers electrons from succinate to CoQ and so on. On page four, I've illustrated the path of electrons from NADH and FADH2 through the electron transport chain to oxygen. Now let's first look at the path of electrons from NADH. Reduced NADH donates two hydrogens to complex one, 
which transfers the two electrons from the hydrogens to coenzyme Q. During this process, complex 1 uses the energy of the transfer to move protons from the matrix across the inner mitochondrial membrane. Reduced coenzyme Q then diffuses through the membrane and transfers electrons to complex 3. Complex 3 transfers electrons to cytochrome C and it also moves protons across the membrane during that process. Cytochrome C is a soluble protein on the outer side of the inner membrane and it transfers electrons to complex 4, which is also known as cytochrome C oxidase. Complex 4 then transfers the electrons to the final acceptor, oxygen. Complex 4 also moves protons across the membrane. This final reaction where electrons and protons are transferred to oxygen to make water is where most of the oxygen we require is consumed. When NADH is reduced to NAD and its pair of electrons are transferred through the chain to oxygen, a total of 10 protons are moved out of the matrix by complexes 1, 3, and 4. Now the hydrogens of FADH2 are transferred to complex 2, which is actually the succinate dehydrogenase of the TCA cycle. Complex 2 passes the electrons to coenzyme Q, and then the same path is followed to complex 3, cytochrome C, and complex 4 to oxygen. Now complex 2 does not move protons across the membrane, so protons are pumped across by complexes 3 and 4 only when FADH2 is the donor of electrons. The transfer of protons across the membrane produces a gradient that has both a chemical and an electrical potential. The chemical potential is the proton gradient that's established with a higher concentration of protons or lower pH outside the matrix. The electrical or voltage gradient occurs due to a charge separation that results from the movement of positive ions across the membrane without negative ions. The energy of the gradient is used to generate ATP through the ATP synthase that spans the inner mitochondrial membrane. The ATP synthase has a base portion known as the FO region and a stalk that projects into the matrix known as the F1 portion. There's a ring of protein units in the FO region that binds to protons and allows them to pass into the matrix. The proton movement through the FO section actually causes rotation of the ring and the stalk that extends into the matrix. In this diagram, the green units rotate and the other units are static. The beta subunits of the F1 portion bind ADP and phosphate and the rotation of the stalk causes a conformational change which squeezes the ADP and phosphate and catalyzes their conversion to ATP. So movement of the protons through the FO portion drive the production of ATP. This video shows protons entering the ATP synthase, binding to the rotating subunits, and then passing into the matrix. You can see the rotation causing a change in conformation of the beta subunits, which bind ADP and phosphate, and then release ATP. There are several drugs and toxins that inhibit the electron transport chain at specific sites. These are listed in the table on page 7. Amatol and rotenone inhibit electron transfer at complex 1. Antimycin inhibits complex 3. Cyanide, carbon monoxide, and sodium azide all inhibit complex 4. Oligomycin inhibits the ATP synthase reaction. These toxins all inhibit at a single site, but the entire process of oxidative phosphorylation and aerobic ATP production will be blocked. Some proteins and chemical compounds allow protons to leak across the inner membrane. This dissipates the proton gradient without generating ATP. 
the energy of fuel oxidation is dissipated as heat rather than being used for ATP synthesis. Uncouplers such as 2,4-dinitrophenol increase rather than inhibit the TCA cycle and electron transfer, but they greatly inhibit the production of ATP. A protein called uncoupling protein, or UCP, was originally identified in the mitochondria of hibernating mammals. The proton allowed the proton gradient to dissipate in order to generate heat during hibernation. Similar proteins have been identified in humans and may play a role in normal physiologic processes such as the regulation of energy expenditure and food intake. The intermitochondrial membrane must be impermeable to most molecules, but there must also be an exchange of molecules between the cytosol and the matrix of the mitochondria. This exchange is mediated by several membrane-spanning transporter proteins. Let's first examine how the hydrogens or reducing equivalents of NADH are transferred into the mitochondria. Reduced NADH is generated in the cytosol in glycolysis, and it can be used for ATP synthesis through oxidative phosphorylation, but the molecule itself cannot be transferred into the mitochondrial matrix. Now there are two mechanisms to transfer the hydrogens into the matrix. On page 7 is a glycerol phosphate shuttle. Here, NADH is used to reduce dihydroxyacetone phosphate to glycerol 3-phosphate. This reaction is catalyzed by glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase in the cytosol. Glycerol 3-phosphate is reoxidized to dihydroxyacetone phosphate on the outer surface of the inner mitochondrial membrane by a pair of membrane-bound isoforms of glycerol 3-phosphate dehydrogenase. An electron pair from glycerol 3-phosphate is transferred to an FAD prosthetic group in this enzyme to form FADH2. The electrons are transferred from FADH2 to coenzyme Q in the electron transport chain. On page 8 is the malate aspartate shuttle. This transport system uses the TCA cycle enzyme malate dehydrogenase, both in the cytosol and the mitochondria. It has the effect of moving an NADH into the mitochondria. The hydrogens are passed to oxaloacetate to make malate, which is moved across to the inner mitochondrial membrane and converted back to oxaloacetate in the matrix, transferring the hydrogens back to an oxidized NAD in the matrix. Oxaloacetate cannot be transported back across the inner mitochondrial membrane, and it's instead converted to aspartate which can be transported across the membrane and then converted back to oxaloacetate and cytosol. So we have two mechanisms to move the hydrogens from NADH in the, into the matrix, but the glycerol 3-phosphate shuttle produces less energy than the malate aspartate shuttle, and that's because the glycerol 3-phosphate shuttle moves the hydrogens to coenzyme Q and skips complex 1. Finally, let's look at some conditions that result from defects in oxidative phosphorylation. These are inherited disorders that result from mutations in the genes that encode oxphos proteins. Now there are about 90 proteins needed for energy production in mitochondria, and most are coded for by genes in the nucleus and then transported into the mitochondria. But there are some proteins in energy production that are coded for by mitochondrial genes. This figure shows the organization of genes in the mitochondrial DNA. So inherited disorders of OxFos can be due to mutations in nuclear or mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA has a very high susceptibility to mutations, and this is due to its close proximity to reactive oxygen species that are produced by the electron transport chain. We'll talk more about that later. Defects in oxidative phosphorylation will, of course, lead to impaired aerobic ATP production, and tissues that have a high energy demand are usually affected. This includes brain and nerves, muscle, heart, and retina. Some of the more common symptoms are hypotonia, or low muscle tone, ophthalmoplegia, or paralysis of muscles that control eye movement, stroke-like episodes, and cardiomyopathy. It's important to point out that diseases due to defects in mitochondrial genes have different inheritance pattern from diseases resulting from mutations in nuclear genes. Mitochondrial DNA is maternally inherited, 
The disease will affect males and females alike, but mitochondrial genes are only passed on through the mitochondria in the egg, and so females are only able to transmit the defective genes to their children. The number of mutant versus wild-type mitochondria varies between cells and tissues, and it is continuously changing, so the symptoms of mitochondrial disorders are highly variable and they can arise at any time in life. This means that two individuals with the same mutation in mitochondrial DNA can have different symptoms and severity of the disease. On page 9 are five of the more common inherited disorders of oxidative phosphorylation. You should be able to recognize these as inherited oxphos disorders, but it's not necessary to remember the characteristics of each disorder. Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy is characterized by central vision loss caused by retinal degeneration. It usually begins in persons' teens or 20s. In most case, cases, the vision loss is severe and permanent. It's due to a defect in complex one of the electron transport chain. Mitochondrial encephalomyopathy with lactic acidosis and stroke-like episodes, or MELOS syndrome, is a disorder in children that have a normal period of development and then develop very severe symptoms, including stroke-like episodes. Myoclonic epilepsy with ragged red fibers. In this disorder, muscle biopsies show a characteristic ragged red fiber, and that's due to the defective mitochondria. kearns sayers syndrome is due to mitochondrial mutations that affect the ocular motor muscles and result in drooping eyelids and problems with eye movements. Here are a series of school photos of a child with kearns sayers syndrome, and it shows the progressive ptosis, or drooping eyelids. Lee's syndrome is a disorder that typically arises in the first year of life, and it's characterized by progressive loss of mental and movement abilities. Typically results in death within a few years, usually due to respiratory failure. Here are a couple of slides of children with Lee's syndrome. So that completes our discussion of the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. I'll close this with a short clip from a video about a young girl with Milos syndrome. My name is Heidi Samos. I have a daughter, Alexandria Samos, who's eight years old with mitochondrial disease. This has definitely been life-changing for us, the mitochondrial disease and diagnosis. Um, it can be a little difficult with, with her brother who's six. Um, I think sometimes he doesn't fully understand that Alexandria is not able to keep up with him. Alexandria receives um, many medications a day. She's on, she has um, a central line in her chest and through that she receives um, IV nutrition, which is called TPN. She is also on IV fluids. Um, she receives IV medication for nausea. She also has a G-tube which she has a drainage bag on um, that helps her stomach and she has a J-tube which we use for medications. Um, I thought as she got older I was not sure how she would handle it. She does very well. Um, she, she explains it to any child she meets, anyone she meets, she'll explain it to them and she just picks it up and she goes. How does she carry all that around with her? We put it into a backpack. Sometimes a rolling pack, backpack if we're going to be out someplace where she would have a difficult time carrying it. I'm hoping that she'll continue to remain stable and she, I know that there will be bumps in the road, um, but we're hoping that those bumps will be small and her, her one goal in life is to be a doctor. So we hope that someday we'll see her become a doctor.